We're continuing our Just Jesus series, looking at the Gospel of Luke, and we're in Easter season, so uh, we're continuing in studies of the Easter story. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's okay. Grab one of the pew Bibles around you. They look just like mine. Uh, and turn to page 1,122, and you will find the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Hey, uh, have you ever heard someone say, failure isn't an option? Yeah, ever heard people say that? You know, uh, what I've learned is that failure isn't an option, it's a reality. <laughs> guys with me on that? I mean, have you ever broken a promise or failed at a commitment or, or maybe you didn't even live up to your own expectations? Uh, but failure, it's a reality. I mean, maybe it's work. You know, you promise, hey, I'll get the job finished, you can count on me, I got this, and, and you blow it. You drop the ball. Or maybe it's with your friends. You know, you look at them and say, hey, I'll be there if you need anything, and you're not. Or you say, hey, you know, when you guys are moving, uh, we'll stay close. And then you wake up one day and realize it's been six months since we talked. Or maybe it's with your kids. Because you say, hey, I'll make it to the game tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll make it to the recital, to the honors program. We'll play ball tomorrow. We'll do it later. And later still hasn't arrived. Maybe it's with your spouse. Because you promised to love and to cherish in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, forsaking all others till death do you part, and one of you didn't keep that. Or maybe it's God. Because you said to God, you know, I'll never do that. Or I'll never do it again. And you failed. Well, if you've ever failed, then uh, I just want you to know today's message is for you. Because we're talking about the great failure. Uh, the story is about Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter. And uh, let me just set it up before we read it. Uh, the, uh, the passage we're going to start at is verse 33 in Luke 22. And it's right after the Last Supper. Jesus has met with his disciples. This is Thursday night. He's going to be crucified on Friday. He's told them that one of you is going to betray me uh, and that all of you are going to abandon me. And here's what Peter says in verse 33. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Skip down to verse 54. What happens after that, that statement is they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays, commits to do the Father's will no matter what. Uh, Judas shows up. Jesus is arrested. All of the disciples flee. It says, then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with Jesus, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. That's the great failure. I mean, this is just part of Peter's story, but it's probably the most famous part. You know, if you grew up around church, you heard this story. You heard about Peter denying Jesus. And think about this. Put it in context. Peter has been following Jesus for three years. I mean, he's been, they've, been, they've been traveling together. Uh, Peter has heard his teachings. He's seen the miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of people who are sick, casting out demons. He even saw Jesus walk on water and calm a storm. He knows Jesus. And, and if that weren't enough, Peter is in the inner circle of the disciples. There's 12 disciples, but there's three that Jesus pulls apart, Peter, James, and John. And he teaches them more stuff and shows them more things. And so Peter knew Jesus, and just a few hours before, he says, I, I will never deny you, even if I have to die. 
And then what does he do? He denies even knowing Jesus. Total fail. And there's no excuses. I mean, what, what are the excuses? Well, self-preservation. I didn't want to die. Yeah, you know, it's just a little white lie. It's not going to hurt anybody. Well, I'm just trying to get information, so I'm, you know, being a, a spy. No, there's no excuses for what he's done. After what he knows and who he is, Peter just was a total fail. And Peter's story is really just like our story, isn't it? I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you know that Jesus loves you. And you know that he's promised to take you to heaven when you die. And you know that he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And that he's forgiven you of all your sins. You know these things, and yet we still fail. We fail. We sin. We disobey. We rebel. We deny. We reject. We betray. Over and over again, we choose the wrong path on purpose. No excuses. Oh, I know, we can make excuses, but in our hearts we know just because we wanted to do it. You know, I, I read Peter's story, and I've heard the story a hundred times. And I read the story again, and I want to believe that I'd do better. I want to believe that I'd have a spine. I want to believe that I'd stand up for Jesus, and I'd say, I'm willing to die for him. But then again, I look at my life, and it's just like Peter's. It's filled with broken promises. I mean, broken promises. That's what Peter did, right? He said, I'm ready to go to prison and die with you. If I must die, I will never deny you. Now, I'm not sure that, that you're like me and Peter, but my life is filled with broken promises. Promises that I've made to God. Things I've promised to Him. Uh, you ever said, I'll never do that? Oops. Have you ever said, I'll, okay, God, I'm really sorry. I'll never do that again. Oops. And if you're like me, you've, you've repented of the same sin over and over and over and over again until you've convinced yourself that God must hate me. That God must hate you because you failed repeatedly and he's got to be angry and he's tired of us and he's done with us. And like Peter, we go out and we weep bitterly. Because our lives are consumed with shame and guilt and failure. If you can relate to that at all, then here's the encouraging reality. God is not afraid of your failure. God's not afraid of your failure. See, this is where the good news starts in this message. Because up till now, it's been pretty depressing, right? We're all failures. It's bad. Broken promises. That's us. But here's the good news. God's not afraid of your failure. He knows us and he loves us. He knows you and he loves you. He sees your life. He's aware of your sin, all of it. And he still wants you to follow him. It gets even better. If you read Psalm 139, uh, King David says that God knows every single thought that you have. Which means... Think about this, which means that God knows all your evil thoughts, all your rebellious thoughts, all your angry thoughts, all your perverted thoughts, and he still wants you to be his child. He's not afraid of our failure. And we see this in the great redemption. The great redemption. This is Peter's story, and it doesn't end with his failure. In fact, Peter's failure is only one chapter of his life. It's only one moment of his life. And Peter did not let his failure define who he was. He didn't go around wearing the badge, I'm the denier, hanging his head in shame. No, he experiences a great restoration. And you see this in the amazing forgiveness that God offered him. Right? Flash forward a couple of days. It's Easter morning. They don't know it's Easter yet, but it's the resurrection morning, right? The women go to the tomb. They find the tomb empty. Jesus appears to the women. They go and tell the disciples. What do the disciples do? <laughs> don't believe them. I mean, after all, they're just women. 
Nobody laughed at that this service. Wow. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that because that's how I would feel, but, but understand something. And this is one of those cool tidbits that we don't get culturally. In the first century, in Judea, where the Bible was written, women's testimony was considered to be not credible. Think about this. In every one of the Gospels, who finds the tomb empty? Women. Who sees Jesus first? The women. Doesn't God have a just... It, it, God is like going, I don't care what your culture says. I don't care if in the court of law this isn't uh, considered credible. I consider it credible. And, and if you want proof that the Bible isn't just something made up, understand this. If somebody was making up this story, it wouldn't have been women finding the tomb. And it wouldn't have been women finding Jesus first because that lacked credibility in that day and age. Not today, but in that day and age. So the disciples didn't believe the women. And Peter went to the tomb and he saw, and it says he marveled, but he didn't believe. And then what happens? Later on, the 11 doubters, because they didn't believe, they're in the upper room and Jesus appears to them. And of course, because they failed and because Peter denied, what did Jesus say to them? You guys are a bunch of losers. Get out. I'm starting over. No, he didn't say that, did he? He revealed himself to them, and he explained to them why he had to die and rise from the dead, and then he commissioned them to be his servants. That's forgiveness. He doesn't kick them out because they failed. And then later, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 21, it, it, it describes a conversation that Jesus and Peter have together. And Jesus lovingly and painfully restores Peter to the place uh, of, of service. Jesus asks him a question three times, kind of mirroring something really significant in Peter's life. Peter, do you love me? And Peter says three times, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, take care of my sheep. Do this for me. You see, Jesus forgave Peter his failure, his denial, his broken promises, and Jesus forgives us. Jesus forgives you. Let that sink in. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the Apostle John writes, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Let that sink in. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful and God is righteous and God will forgive us our sins and purify us of all our sin, all our unrighteousness. Think about that. Not some of our sin. Not a portion of our sin. He's not looking at some of us and going, hey, you're okay. I forgive your sins, but you guys have really messed up. You're gross. I'm not going to forgive you. No, it's all of our sin is forgiven. Every bit of it. And, and, and today, I want you to recognize that. And I got to ask you this question. Have you experienced that life-changing cleansing from Jesus? As you're sitting here today, do you know that you are forgiven of all your sin? Because God wants you to be forgiven. Second question is, have you forgiven yourself? You see, some of us are living joy-deprived lives because even though we know God forgives us, we're still punishing ourselves. We're still beating ourselves up for our failures for our denials, for our rebellion. And God wants us to experience his forgiveness. Look, he didn't fail any worse than Peter. And Peter was forgiven and he received the mercy because, and we know this because the next time we see Peter, he is involved in powerful service. Powerful service. Again, fast forward a few more weeks. Uh, Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost. See, Jesus tells the disciples, hey, you guys need to stay in Jerusalem. Wait, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. They're in, in Jerusalem. They're praying. And on, on the Feast of Booths, uh, this time of Pentecost, that the Jews from all over the world are gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate, uh, the Holy Spirit falls on all of the followers of Jesus. And they go out from that room, and, and they go out into the streets, and they're speaking in languages they've never learned. 
the languages of the people who've come from all over the world. It'd be like me suddenly speaking Russian. I don't know Russian. I can't speak it. But suddenly I can start speaking Russian. That's what the Holy Spirit enabled them to do. And so a crowd gathered because people thought they were crazy. Because it was weird. And it was weird. And as the crowd gathered, Peter got up and publicly proclaimed Jesus and told the story of his death and his resurrection and and how he wanted to change lives. And 3,000 people became followers of Jesus that day. Think about this. The failure who freaked out when he was questioned by a little slave girl is now bold and courageous and used by God to help launch the church. Isn't that cool? That's what God does. Now, remember, we're a lot like Peter, aren't we? I mean, we, we fail like Peter, and, and we're forgiven like Peter. You know what that means? That means God wants to use us to serve him like Peter. God wants to use us to serve him in a powerful way, to make a difference in this world, to change the world, just like the Apostle Peter. And, and this is difficult for some of us to see because you believe That your failure has disqualified you from serving God. You believe that your denial, your faithlessness, your rebellions have disqualified you from serving God. And, And maybe a church or a pastor has helped you to come to that conclusion. And if that's the case, then I'm sorry, but they were wrong. They were wrong. You see, if Jesus has called you to follow him then Jesus has called you to serve him. After all, we are servants of Christ. We're servants of Christ. And and so um, we just have to figure out how God wants us to serve him. We just have to figure out what what we're supposed to be doing in service of Jesus to make a difference in this world. And, And here at Calvary, if you're part of Calvary, we want you to connect. That's what we have life groups for. And we want you to serve. Serve. Now, some of you are going, well, I don't know if I'm part of Calvary or not. Here's, here, let me just give you a test. If you've been here like more than three times, you're part of Calvary. (laughs) Okay? You go, I haven't taken the intro class yet. And we know you haven't taken the intro class yet because you still think that means you can park in guest parking. (laughs) If you've been here more than three times, you need to repent. Okay? (laughs) Park farther out. Leave that for the real guests. Because you're a part of Calvary. If you, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you don't have to think, where am I going to go to church? You're part of Calvary. All right? Do you, you get that? So we want you to connect. Join a life group some way. Bible study. Be, in, be involved. And we want you to serve. And, and, uh, and we realize that a lot of us go, well, I don't know what I can do for, for God. And so uh, since that's difficult, we started a ministry and we want to keep it really simple. So we called it Serve. So if you want to serve, then, you know, go online then, and fill out an application. Application just means, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I'd like to do. Here's when I'm available to do it. That's it. You can pick one up at the, you know, Connection Center if you're low tech. That's fine. It's, we got paper ones too. But uh, you fill an application saying, hey, I want to help. And people contact you and say, here's how you can help. Um, it, you go, well, I still don't know. Uh, we got a class called Equip. You take intro, you take equip. Equip just tells you, you know, here's who Calvary is, here's why we serve, here's how we serve. Helps you to figure out some things that you can do to serve. Because we want to help you do what God's called you to do. And think about this. We, we need all of us to make a difference in this world, in this community. We're about to occupy a, a new you know, sanctuary here in a few weeks, and, and, uh, and it's getting really close, and, and God's been sending us more people, and guess what? We're in that new building. God's going to send us more people, which means we need more servants to help take care of them. So maybe you can do something to help serve. Maybe you're actually friendly and you like people. Then we got a greeting ministry. Love for you to be a part of that. You know what? Uh, if God sends us more people, that means he's going to send us more children. Right now on a weekend, we have over 200 kids involved in our children's ministry. That number is going to go up. You know what that means? That means we need more people to volunteer for the nursery. And some of you are going like, yep, I'm older. I did my time. (laughs) I ain't going back into that the nursery. I want you to think about this. A lot of you are praying that your adult children will take your grandchildren to church where they live. 
And if your adult children take your grandchildren to church, you're also praying then that that church will have people who are working with their children and in the nursery to love your kids and teach your kids, your grandkids. And there are grandparents of those kids and grandkids here in Lake Havasu that are praying for the same thing. And so if you're good with kids, then why not go ahead and volunteer an hour a month to serve in the nursery and love somebody else's kids so that their parents can come to know Christ and God can change their lives and answer their prayers. And maybe God will answer your prayers because you're doing something you can to answer somebody else's. You ever think about that? That's the way the kingdom works. And God's called us to serve. And if you love kids, if you know which end is up, then um, you probably could have a ministry. If you don't know which end is up, then don't volunteer to work in the nursery, okay? We got someplace else for you. Or maybe you just, maybe you like toys. You know, maybe you're a tech guy. Um, uh, I don't know if, anybody go to the Billy Graham thing this weekend? I went Friday night. Anybody else be there? Okay. Well, not, not a lot of you went, but uh, they have some really cool tech out there. Lights and sound and all this kind of stuff, the stage videos and stuff like that. We're going to have that stuff in our new worship center. I mean, uh, it's going to be way different than, than this. It's going to be way cool. And, and, uh, and, and here's the thing. we got new toys. We need people to play with them in the name of Jesus, okay? We're not just talking about <laughs> for you. But we, we need people who want to go, hey, I, I want to be a part of a really cool lighting system. You know, Because right now our lights are up or down. And, and it's going to be way different than that. And, and sound system is way cooler. And, and video that we, we're like, oh, we don't even know what to do with this stuff. And, and so if you'd like to come and help us and learn how to do it with us and, and change people's lives because you're allowing ministry to happen. There's so many ways that, that you can serve God in the church but beyond the church walls. You know, serve ministry, the, the primary focus is on connecting with the community so that we can go out into the community, represent Jesus Christ, and partner with agencies and organizations and, and help them fulfill their missions while we're representing Jesus doing it. So we partner with uh, the, the food bank and interagency. We partner with big brothers and big sisters, and we partner with uh, the school district. We're getting ready to do teacher appreciation here in, in about a month and a half. And, and we've got all kinds of projects lined up. Haven House is one of our partners, and so many more. And we would love to unleash you as a servant of Christ to make a difference in this world because God wants to use you in a powerful way. You know the most powerful way he can use you? And we've challenged you this for months now. When we're in Sweetwater Campus, who are the three unchurched friends that you're going to invite so that they can possibly meet Jesus as their Savior and their Lord and have their life changed like you? You see, if God has called you to follow him, then God has called you to serve him. No matter what anybody else says, listen to Jesus at that point. So, Peter experienced the great redemption of forgiveness and serving because Peter didn't give up. He had perseverance. He didn't quit. He failed, but he didn't quit. He cried, but he still believed. He broke his promise, but he saw God's redemption because he kept showing up. You know who in the Easter story missed out on redemption? This guy named Judas, the betrayer. Because after he betrayed Jesus, he was filled with remorse, and he went out and he hung himself. He killed himself. He gave up. He quit. And, and I, I just can't help but imagine, what would it what would happen if he'd just gone and, and, you know, disappeared for a few days, and then Easter happened, and you know what? The grace of God would have flowed to him too. But he didn't see it because he gave up. Peter was broken in his failure. He was fearful of the consequences. But he saw the redemption of God because he endured. God uses our perseverance, our endurance, to build his character in our lives. That's his plan. He doesn't want us to quit because he's going to redeem our lives. He's going to forgive our sins. He's going to empower us to serve him if we hold on. This morning, some of you that are here are broken. You've failed and others have failed you. You've broken promises. Promises have been broken towards you. And maybe you're feeling hopeless or ashamed or guilty or just in pain. Please don't give up. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on your church family. 
Don't give up on being forgiven or on serving again. Because Peter's story is our story. And from it, we can know with certainty that God uses failures and losers and rejects to build his kingdom and to demonstrate his mercy. I just absolutely love that. That God uses failures and losers and rejects to build his kingdom and demonstrate his mercy. Sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, well, you know, I'm not like so-and-so. They've got it all together. They're really spiritual. They're really gifted. I could never be like them. I'm not good enough. Well, you know, let me encourage you to do something. Read the Bible. Because the Bible is filled with failures and losers and rejects that God takes and uses in dramatic ways to make a difference in this world, to build his kingdom, to change lives, and that's what he wants to do. It was true for Peter. I guarantee you it's true for me. And it'll be true for you. If you don't give up. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. You love us. You pursue us. You you want us. Even though you know our failure. You know our filth. You know our rebellious hearts. And yet you still desire us to be sons and daughters of God. So, Father, today, let us sense your love, your mercy. Let it fill this room. Let your spirit speak into our lives. As you call us to trust you, as you call us to embrace forgiveness, as you call us to forgive ourselves, Lord, let us just know that as we stand in your presence, it is well with our souls. Because you do not despise us, but instead you love us. You demonstrated that by sacrificing Jesus on the cross. So let that message burn into our hearts and change us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping our God.